This episode of the In Focus series features Mark the Hammer Castanini. Mark is the owner and head trainer of the Hammers Gym in Melbourne, Australia, and promoter of the Warriors Way Muay Thai Kickboxing Series. Well, hey Hammer, how are you? Welcome to the show. Good mate. Thanks, William. Thank you. Thanks for being on, mate. Let's start it off with this photo here, taking that Warriors Way 22. You've done so many shows now. I'm sure each one has a significant memory to you. Um, yep. I'm sure you have a million stories to share from these shows. This is taking that one of your famous mid-fight speeches when you're addressing what's going on in the night. And this was one of your foremans. What's it like as a promoter and having all years and experience in the industry, finding local talent to fill up your card? I mean, these days, rarely do you have a fight show where you don't have your own boys on it. Yeah, look, it's, it's become, it's difficult because number one, there's so many promotions. Number two, you know, there's a lot of fighters now contracted to one championship as well, that are the upper level fighters that I like to, to I suppose, host. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, that, that makes things increasingly difficult. But um, this picture here with the four man, you know, Albert, Ramesh, Indigo, um, you know, Quan, the, these guys, I was really excited about this one, you know, and, and it ended up being such a great four man. Um, with good local talent. Of course, you know, being quite honest, when you have all guys from the one state, it's a good, te- it's a good ticket seller. Yeah. And when it's an up, upper level quality, so people can't just look at it and go, oh, yeah, he'll win that. You know, there's no, there's no um, guess, guessing who could win. You know, it's like it's quite obvious. So when it's quite obvious, uh, it reflects in a number of ways. People won't be as motivated to come to the show, et cetera, et cetera. So as a promoter, you know, speaking for myself, um, I always try and match fights that even I can't pick the winner easily. Because if I can't pick it, I guarantee most other people can't. And this was a classic example of that. It's a nice, also your choice of venue too, the Doncaster Shopping Town Hotel. It's a very intimate, intimate venue. Wherever you stand in a venue, you get a good view of the ring and the local talent you bring on. It feels like a weekend where everyone catches up with everybody because everyone knows each other. It's, it's yeah. like a big catch up, really. It is, it is. And, and that's, the, that's the whole thing about it. You know, we are somewhat of a community um, and even... You know, the gyms all come together to support their fighters or, or there's a lot of gyms that just come together on the night because they know the show's going to be a good show. So they make it a social outing for their for their club. Um, so it does have a great atmosphere. The venue really lends itself to being a good fight venue, which I didn't know at the start when I, when I started doing Warriors Way. Obviously, it was with Carl Drapper, my original partner. Um, and, and the venue was... We, we didn't want to go into anyone's area, so to speak, because promoters can be quite territorial. So, you <laughs> yeah, know, you, you try and stick to your little, you know, your hood. <laughs> and it was like, okay, well, it's in, you know, 5, 10K from where, where our gyms are, where, where we base ourselves. The gyms around will hopefully support from the east or the southeast. Yeah. Um, so it, it was, you know, it really was a cup. It took a little bit of, um, I suppose, it was there was a bit of a teething um, time in, in just getting the setup right um, but then the venue you know the venue realized that the shows are professional um, they're obviously broadcast uh, nationally uh, on Fox Sports so they you know they're, they're uh, in themselves quite prestigious for the sponsors and the venue because they're getting airtime so you know the venue will put when the shows air on Fox Sports they'll put it all through the clubs or through the, you know their pubs because it's the Australian Hoteliers Group own venue so they put it in all the pubs great exposure for the hotel great exposure for the event um so and, and as it's a bit of an auditorium almost uh, sort of a feel so coliseum auditorium or whatever you want to call it the yeah. rings in the middle the people are all around it um, works well yeah and the fire and you know you ringside you're taking the shots it feels like there's people just all around you you know right behind that camera with you i reckon yeah. half the time and like I said, it's local talent too. It's one of the shows where even at the end of the night, by the main event, you still have a good crowd around you because everyone knows each other. Everyone's there to support everyone. It's not one of those shows where come main events, half the crowd's gone. Yeah, yeah, that's very rare. You know, people stay. And it's also how, how you, um, stack, not stack the card, but how you order the card, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I try and have a good flow knowing that if I put a lot of all the fighters from one gym on one part of the card, 
there, there is a chance where they, you know people might go, oh, well, we've seen everyone from our gym, we'll leave now. So I try, we try and stagger it to keep people there, to keep them engaged, um, to, to vary the talent as well. So, you know, the mix of talent, um, I keep the novices or the lesser experienced fighters obviously always at the start of the show. But then there's, you know, some fighters that may have had six or seven fights, but they're real crowd pleasers. So I'll move them up the card. You know, maybe they should be fight number four, but um, they may be fight number 10 because I yeah. know they're going to bring good entertainment uh, for the sponsors and the crowd. And that motivates people to stay longer. When, they, when they're when they seeing sort of banger after banger, it's like, man, they don't want to leave because they've just seen like an incredible fight. They're like, well, maybe the next one's going to be good too. So I think it's the standard of fight brings excitement and, and that keeps the crowd there as much as anything. So, you know, it's a bit of, it's a bit of both. It's, it's familiar. It's the communities, the fight community getting together, but it's also the quality of fight from start to finish is generally pretty exciting. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't think many fight fans realize there's an art to crafting a good fight card. Say you have a 10, 12 card fight card. You want to make sure each fight gets slightly better than the next one. It's like a, progression definitely definitely it's you sort of you're building to the crescendo of the exactly. main event of you know uh, you know the title fight but sometimes some of the main fights you know they they don't have the the zing of the undercard fights because the guys on the undercards you know they want to get in and make a statement and you know they're excited to be there you know when you've got some of the pros that have fought you know 20 30 40 50 times it's another day, it's another another day in the, the office for them you know they go through the motions but the guys on the undercard, which I really love, and the girls, man, they, they feel like they're on, you know, they're, they're honoured, they're excited, they're motivated to be on the card. They want to, they want that big break. They want people to to stand up and take notice of them, and they want to be the fight of the night. So you know, sometimes the pros, you know, it's almost paralysis by analysis. They analyse their performance and their strategy and everything so much yeah. that they just don't go in and you know fight, you know, sort of balls out. You know, they. They just sort of hang back a bit and it becomes a real strategic battle, which the purists will appreciate. But the fans just want to see people stand and bang, you know, which is yeah. why the heavyweights are all popular, so popular because everyone knows the heavyweights have got the limited gas tank so they get in <laughs> and they throw them out. You know, they throw them. And that's big shots thrown in, in uh, you know, in an exciting sort of culmination to the fight. So, you know, that's, that's I suppose, my theory on it. Just out of curiosity, um, with your current ring and canvas at the moment with your venue, it's a little bit smaller than most rings. Do yep. you think that plays a factor in certain fighters? Like, for example, someone who's really rangy like Ramesh, using that to his advantage to cut people off? Yeah, good question. And, um, you know, we've had, I've had a number of di different size rings in there. I choose a smaller ring. Number one, it's for, for crowd comfort, especially the VIPs and the corporates ringside because... Yep. You know, without them, we don't have a show. You can have a massive ring in there and it's, you know, all of that. But at the end of the day, I've got to make everyone comfortable and fit the venue and the, and the broadcasting style that I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. So that ring suits that. It also doesn't give fighters a lot of room to run. Um, it keeps the action tight. And generally, to be honest with you, because, my, because Muay Thai in essence, if you look at any card of, of Muay Thai these days, whether it's my shows or others, there's not a lot of heavyweights. No. So the bigger rings, you know, you need them if you've got a lot of heavyweight fighters. But when you're talking, you know, welterweights and, and the lighter weighted fighters, the smaller ring is ample for them. It's going to keep them busy. It's going to keep them engaged. And, and because the smaller ring fits the visibility in the, you know, for the venue, it fits it perfectly. So the ring plays part in why it doesn't matter where you stand, you get a good spot, you know, because... Like I dodge the pillars out in the on the outer because of the size of the ring as well. Yeah. So yeah, good, great question though, and uh, thanks for that. No, perfect. Going back to the old gym down the road. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, this was taken at our good friend Nugget on one of his seminars, which I love his seminars. Yep. I was actually lucky to be actually taking part in the seminar and then running back and forth to take photos in between. What's your yeah, opinion? I um, about I was the say, as you've done many times, <laughs> that's you know that's that's the martial artist inside of me. You know, I like to <laughs> also be part of it. What's the, how important do you see is it for a martial artist and a trainer to keep learning like yourself and Dom? Look, I think there's a, there's a statement that that I think I, I sort of try to adhere, adhere to, uh, and that's always to have a beginner's mind. When you think you know it all, 
that's when you, you're going to become stale and you're not going to be creative with your teaching. Um, I, I have no fear of bringing anyone into the gym if I think they're a credible trainer that has a, a unique skill or mindset even, you know, or something to offer my, my students, my members. I'm not fearful of bringing someone in thinking I'm going to be shown up or oh, this guy's going to come in and my teaching isn't going to stand up. I'm actually quite proud because the number of people that have come in, Nugget, Richard Norton, you know, John Wayne Parr, uh, you know, I've had iconic martial art instructors in here, Stephen Seagal. And all these seminars, you're in there doing it as well. Sure. And, and the one thing that when it happens, I sort of do, you know, get, get a nice warm feeling is when they talk a strategy or they show a technique and it's exactly what I was teaching my guys just the other night. You know what I mean? Like I'll talk angle, I'll talk theory, I'll talk strategy and I, I explain it to, to the guys and we work it. And, you know, as I say, familiar, familiarity breeds contempt sometimes, especially for the guys that have been around a long time. They're like, oh, yes, going on and, you know, banging on about the same stuff yeah. again. But when someone else comes in and basically verifies and justifies your teaching and your methods, you, you know, I, I love it because it sort of validates my, my credibility by, by bringing someone in who's going to test that. And many, many times I bring, you know, high-ranked instructors in here because I'm not scared. I'm not scared that they're going to come in and show something that's going to, you know, uh, show a flaw in my teaching. Yep. The fact that they come in without any collaboration teach in their own style, in their own way, and, and validate exactly what I've been teaching the night before when we've just been doing our closed class. You know, I'm happy with that. And, I, I, and as I said, every time it happens, I, I, will, I walk away with a bit of a smile because I'm like, yeah, I told you guys. Man, I see that too. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's how we've got to do it, you know. So, yeah. you know, if, if anything, it validates my teaching. Now, I've been to your gym many times before at the new gym and at the old gym and the way you run your gym is slightly different than other gyms even though you do have fighters you instill a very structured routine everyone's in uniform there's a strong discipline and yeah. I'm sure that's coming from your karate background and yeah. we've both seen a lot of fighters after they've had the last fight or just drop off they don't really see the need to keep training and I find that it could be because there is there is no martial arts aspect in that how yeah. important do you think it is to also instill um the martial arts aspect into fight training let me say this system is everything you know um systemized learning is the only way people should be teaching their students you know um i, I had this conversation recently with nathan nathan corbett who's beyond the, you know beyond the shadow of the doubt was one one of the best muay thai fighters in the world and multi-titled world champion you can't question his his uh his ring pedigree. And he's exactly of the same mindset, especially as, as things are going on. It's like the one thing sometimes that Muay Thai does um, or, or some of the gyms do miss, and that's the discipline and um, I suppose the, the, um, the structure that is needed to keep people engaged. You know, when I started teaching, you're right, I come from a Kyokushin full contact background and I, I you know, I'll put, a, I'll put any fighters in and, and, and let them have a crack at bare knuckle, full contact karate. Yeah. And, and let me see how easy it is, you know, if you've never done it before. It's oh, there's quite no padding behind that. Nothing, man. Like you, you're punching and you're hitting and you're body ripping. There's no gloves. You're getting hit with bare knuckles. You know, you're getting kneed. And, you know, as, as with Muay Thai, you're getting kicked in the face, all of that. But that's, that was my background in, in karate. But... You have to understand, I trained under Bob Jones and the Bob Jones Corporation a long time. And Bob was the innovator in bringing Muay Thai to Australia, really, and popularizing it and, and giving it structure because he, he did have a grading system with the BJC. And many, many, many people have come through that. They might, they might have forgotten it, but they have come through it and they should pay credit and homage to that because it was the structure of how, how the BJC started teaching Muay Thai that had the right pathway for people to, to stay involved and for it to grow. If, if you just turn into a fight gym, you, you'll have your, your, you know, your half a dozen or your dozen hardcore people that just want to come in and skip and shadow and spar and bang the bag. But you know what? That's, that's any boxing gym. Yeah. You know, you can get that, but 
what happens if you're not a fighter? You, you have to have something for people that don't want to fight, that still love the martial art. They still love Muay Thai. They still love and, and will get the benefit from it for, for self-defense. You know, I've worked 20 plus years on the doors of nightclubs. I've done bodyguarding. I've done all that, that stuff. And I've trained in a lot of, a lot of styles. And I've dabbled in a lot of things because I've always had a thirst for knowledge. And when, you, when I've come down to it, the most easily uh, affected techniques of Muay Thai in self-defense, you, you can't deny that, you know. And even some of the traditional arts, they take that, those sort of simple, you know, clinch, knee, elbow strikes for self-defense as well. So Muay Thai is a perfect martial art. And, you know, Muay Buran is, you know, the, obviously the, the self-defense aspect of Muay Thai. You know, it's very effective, but there's so much emphasis just put on the competition and the sports side that people can, can forget about uh, the Muay Thai system as being a, a proper martial art when it's taught the right way with a hierarchical system, um, a systemized learning, so you don't overwhelm people with too much technique or too much conditioning or too much of one thing. Everything has to be put in certain order. And that's, that's why, you know, the, the Muay Thai Systems International thing that I'm, I'm a part of now is all about bringing clubs together and getting people knowledge the right time, getting, getting them graded and accredited to, to, for the skills that they're learning and then putting them up to that next level, checking this, their technique. You know, it's like a checkpoint. You know, yeah. every, every so many you know, lessons, an instructor, you know, should check on his, the progress individually of each student to make sure that they're getting what they're paying for you know, because anyone can turn up to a gym and hit a bag and, you know, get punched up in sparring. There's no, yeah. you know, that's easy. And then, of course, the toughest are always going to rise to the top and, and be the good fighters. But, you know, it's not just about fighting. It's about, it's about health. It's about well-being. It's about empowering people's minds and bodies and giving them an outlet, you know, stress outlet, giving them strategies to cope with depression, you know, giving them you know, self-esteem boost. Um, you know, fighting will not do that for you. Fighting can, in fact, enhance some of that, you know, especially if you're getting concussions too, too often. It can lead to depression, you know, so on and so forth. You know, you can start to doubt yourself. You can think you're not good enough for the sport and you can fall away and then go off, go off into the sunset and do something else. Yeah. When that person could have, you know, 80% of the attributes needed to be a good martial artist, doesn't mean, you, you, you know, not everyone's cut out to, to jump in the ring and fight. You know, and that's that's yeah. why I set up my, my teaching and my gym the way it is. And I'm, I want to bring as much knowledge, as much learning in on all levels, you know. So sorry for the long-winded answer. Oh. But, you know, we can't and going back answer. to what you're saying about being a martial artist and the ranking system, I've seen it firsthand. I would be at one of your shows one weekend seeing your top tier guys like River Daz and Chris Harrington fight. Yeah. And then the following the week, week, going to your gym, seeing them in, the, in line, doing form work, wearing a uniform, acting just like everyone else even though they're a fighter yeah. they're still doing the same system and that just gives you know being a martial artist that just gives someone who's wearing a white singlet or being a white belt gives them the yeah. idea to them it's like if i keep training the way i am i'll get there eventually 100 percent. and these guys are, you know they don't they, they help to bring you know we help to bring everyone up you know i've been in a lot of gyms and i've trained and sparred in a lot of gyms and you know, some of, sometimes it's just a bloodbath and you walk in knowing that you're going to have to fight, you know, yeah. literally for your life, you know, because if you don't, if you don't smack on with the guys, they, they're going to just take you apart in order to, you know, to better themselves. And, and you just become fodder if you're, if you're not capable of dealing with that overwhelming, you know, experience of having someone in front of you that's a lot harder, a lot more experience, that knows a lot more, has a lot more angles. You know, yeah. they'll just beat on you and pull you apart and make you feel devastated. I never will have that in my gym, you know. And I've always said if, I, if someone is in my gym being a bully, I will line up all my best fighters and I'll, I'll throw so many challenges at them, they won't know what hit them, yeah. you know. Because one way or the other, they're going to learn to toe the line and they're going to learn to work in and be good people. Um, and, and it goes back to when someone walks into my gym, I teach only a limited amount of technique because... It's, it's taken me years to acquire the skills that, that I have. Why should I give that to someone who walks in and gives me 10 bucks for a lesson and then I'm going to give them all my knowledge? You know, you come in, do your time, be a part of the club, you know, show humility, be humble, 
you know, uh, don't take advantage of anyone if you have a better skill level, if you're bigger. Sometimes guys will come in and they're, or, or girls and they're a lot bigger and they'll bully, you know, someone that's 80, 90 kilo has to be able to spar with someone who's 50, 60 kilo and mix it up, you know, and, and work in. Yep. And then, of course, when you've got bigger weighted people, you, you work to that level. So if they're going to bully people because they're bigger or they have more skills, it doesn't cut it for me and they won't progress, you know, within my gym. They'll, you know, they, they're going to go nowhere and eventually they'll leave and they'll go somewhere where that's accepted because it's certainly not accepted here. Yep. And, and I think, you know, there was a lot of doubting my methodology in the early days. And it was like, oh, you can't train fighters like that, blah, blah, blah. Well, I've got a fighter fighting on the world level now, you know, in River Fights on Glory. You know, Chris Harrington was winning Australian titles. David Bashner going back. You know, when I wanted to test my fighters in the early days, I said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to jump on a plane. We're going to go to Thailand and we're going to fight in Thailand and let's see how the teaching works out. It's no use for me to fight some kid here in a pub and, you know, and go, well, we, we, you know, we won. It's like, well, you, you know, I wanted to fight people that had good knowledge in Muay Thai that would challenge us. And if you go to Thailand and you lose against the Thai that's, you know, well equipped, there's no disgrace in that either because, you know, it's still going to challenge, you know, challenge our teaching and challenge us as, as individuals. But we went over. I took two guys over that had been with me and did the program uh, two for two, no problem. Come back and it give me more faith just to stick to my, my teaching and stick to how my business has grown. I've got this gym here and it's 2,000 square metres. You know, we've got, you know, 1,500 members. I've got a high proportion of those members that are martial artists and it's all built on system. You know, mm. that's, that's what's made this possible for me. Because if I was just teaching, you know, as I said, just that fight style teaching, I'd still be in my garage with half a dozen people, you know, and, and it's not always about money. It's about, you know, obviously... The financial benefit is, is great. We all want to make a living. But greater than that is that when you do something well, people will gravitate to that. Yes. You know, you, you're a good chef. You're going to get people coming to your restaurant. You're a good mechanic. You build good race cars. You get people bringing their cars to you to fix them because they want that performance. Well, people wouldn't be coming to me if I didn't produce the goods for them individually. It's and been I proven. It's been the tested too. Before. Correct. Correct. So, you know, I put my, I put my guys up against anyone and, you know, we, we hold our own, you know, without, I never overmatch them. I never undermatch them. It's, it's always an even fight. I always take, when I take fights, I challenge them, you know, you got to step up for the titles. You got to have even fights for the non-title fights. Yeah. You know, we don't back, we don't back down from matchups too. That's perfect. mate. I know you're very passionate about that to martial arts and it shows. Now I'd like to ask you about, what you're wearing, the Hammers walkout outfit. Now, I've known you for years, yeah. but I've never really thought much about that. It's very iconic. The flames, you have yeah. writing that says fear none and respect all. And I'd like to ask a bit more about your certain walkout because there's a bit of an art to it. Hey, it's always you leading the boys out. They have the hands on you, leading them out from a change room into the ring. And you see a yeah. lot of gyms, they change up what they wear, but no, you, your team has been wearing that same iconic black. Look, it's, um, you know, yeah, I, I think... You know, I designed that back in the day and it was made in, you know, obviously made in Thailand, uh, you know, by, by MTG and the you know, WMC was associated with the equipment and, and they making the uniforms and stuff. And um, yeah, this, you know, I've had various, <laughs> I've had various comments made about it. Some people goes, oh, it looks, it looks a bit bikey and this and that. <laughs> but it was, you know, I've had a lot of interesting, interesting comments about it. Um, the flames, you know, the design, it was just, I wanted to stand out when we come out. The patch on the back, you know, it's signifies old school, where. It, pardon? It's old school. It's old school. You know that that was it. You know, the, that that fight robe is everyone wears the fight robe. The trainer jackets, all the guys that help in the corner have to have a jacket. You know, um, I, I I had that design done. You know, and I I actually, you know, you've you've actually just poked a, an old memory. Let's because go. <laughs> one of my one of, one of my favourite pairs of fight shorts when I was fighting was the colour was black with gold and red, and it was like that. I wore those shorts. I wore the hell out of those shorts. Yeah. They were just my favourite shorts. Yeah, so I always liked that colour scheme. So when I come to doing, you know, the the design, I based it on that that pair of shorts. 
and then you know the flames I seen then some I thought that looks pretty cool <laughs> you know uh, I was not you know there was it was just at the time it's probably you know what it's probably a bit dated now and you're right it's probably a bit old school now do you think you'll change it or do you think we'll just keep the same one man I, I don't know there's so much that 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 fight rovers you know those that uniforms fought in in Thailand it's fought in Vegas it's yeah. fought in China it's fought in Europe you know with river you know like Every fighter that I've had has always, you know, we've gone out with it. And it's like, it's a bit of an institution now. And yeah, maybe one day I'll have to, you know, reinvent it and, and do something different. But it's pretty good. It's not, it's not falling apart. It's been made, it's been really well made. That's great, and, you know, mate. let's face it, it doesn't, it doesn't get used that much. And I, I have it sort of dry cleaned and, it, you know, it sits <laughs> in my office proudly. I would show you it's hanging on my office window. For all to see it oversees the gym that thing you know you look up from the gym you see my office and you see the fight row hanging in the window because yep. that's I'm so, I'm so proud of of what it's represented um, as a gym for me and and I'm so proud and blessed to have had the fighters that have entrusted me as a trainer to wear it um, and and want to wear it you know like there's guys that come through the amateurs they want to wear that robe you know they want to be that that guy walking out with the with the hammers uniform on yeah. Um, so, and the fear, none, respect, all was something that was my gym moniker that I started in 1995, and I knew I had to come up with something when I was doing my grading books. Um, the, the, uh, it's out there a little bit, and in fact, good old Stefan Fox, when he was doing the the contender series, you'll see that it's got um, respect, all, fear, none. So he, mm. he's put it, he put it in the contender stuff, and he told me, he goes. Hammer, I really like that on your books. And I'm like, oh, thanks, Stefan. He goes, yes, I'm going to steal it and we're going to use it on the contender. I'm like, you got to gig <laughs> All right, we'll do that. that. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, you know, that, that was just something that represented my mindset. Uh, I'll, and it goes back to, as I said, my security days. I, I'd be respectful to everyone. Doesn't matter who it is, size, color, all of that's all topical now. You respect everybody, young, old, capable, not capable. But if someone's going to be a dick and put it on you, well, you can't fear that person, you know. And I've I've fought a lot of guys, you know, doing my security work and stuff like that. That will look like the scariest people you ever meet, you know, with, the, with all the tats and everything. And you look at them and you're like, man, he's going to be the hardest person in the world to fight. But they're the ones sometimes with a, with a weaker resolve. Mm. And then there's guys that have just been so um, unassuming, and they're just hard tradies or they're just people that have had heart. They don't look hard, you know, but when you get into a physical scrap with them, they are going to try and rip your head off more so than the guy that is trying to look intimidating. You know, I believe the people that sometimes don't look intimidating are the ones that have the most belief and self-belief. And now if you're going to get in my face, I'm going to fight you, you know? Yeah. And, you know, look, you know, as I said, you look, you've got a picture of River there. He's not the scariest looking dude yep. and he's the friendliest kid unknown and he's the friendliest person around but get in the ring switch the switch goes on he's on and he fights with the most you know he fights with brutality and skill as soon as the fight finishes he's back to being the nice guy that and the gold-hearted person that he is and i love that and that's that's what i want that's what i believe in so that comes back to that fear nobody you fight everybody if, if, if you have to but and you've got to give them the respect before and after and during. You should always respect people, um, generally, no matter what. You know that's that's that should yeah. be everyone's sort of you know trait in life. It's perfect, mate. What's it like for you when you're walking out with a fighter? Just moments before they're about to touch gloves, and you're one of the few trainers that actually walks out with a fighter. What's yeah. it? Yeah. What's going through your mind at this moment? Well, you know, there's a reason I do it. It's yep. because I will be w with my fighter in that fight as much as I possibly can. Man, if I can be in the ring with them, throw them punches, <laughs> I'll do that. But I'm not allowed, so you've got to get out eventually. Yeah. But when I face off or when they face off, I want to be standing next to them. You know, I want that their opponent to see they're not just fighting my fighter. They're fighting me. They're fighting my gym. They're fighting our reputation. So I, I go to war with my people. doesn't matter who it is, my fighters, my friends. If the shit hits the fan, I want to be there. And it, as you know, you mentioned before, you said it's old school. You know, it's a little bit old school. My mentality is old school, man. Like, I, you know, I don't look for problems with anyone. 
But if problems come my way, you know, I'm there. If problems come the way of my friends and family and someone disrespects them or disrespects my fighters, I want to be there. You know, we train, we, we go through the pain together. And at that last moment when they touch gloves just before the shit's about to get real, yeah. I want to be there with them, showing them that i got their back. Literally, I got their back standing right there over their shoulder. So when the opponent looks at my fighter, he look at, he's going to look at me too because, you know, he's fighting a team. He's not just fighting an individual. Um, and that's, you know, that's sort of my mentality. And back in the day, every trainer used to get in the ring and, and you, your fighters would touch gloves and the trainers would shake hands as just a show of respect for each other as well. These days, you know, people, you know, people don't do that as much. Um, but I, I love getting in and I love, you know, I love to, to, to you know, show the respect to, to everybody. Yeah. But I also want my fighters to feel like I've got their back always. That's great to see. And that's really nice to see too. And like I said, I think you're one of the few, if not the only one that does it these days. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a bit of an old school thing. It's a, you know, from the kickboxing days, every trainer used to just to get in, jump the ropes, you know, listen to the, you know, the other thing is that get involved, listen to the, to the final instructions. Because mm. even at that time, something might pop up and you go, hey, hey hang on a minute. No, <laughs> we didn't agree to that. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm there that whole way. I don't want my fighter to deal with anything apart from, you know, throwing up and throwing down yeah. the, the, the business side of it. And the dealing with all that side of it, that's the, I'm, do, I'm doing that. I'm doing that for them. They don't worry about none of that, you know. Perfect. Back at Doncaster Shopping Town Hotel, every fight show, you've got your own little corner. That's, you know, you guys are always there wrapping your hands. <clears throat> that's your own little team building area. You have your Moncon up in the corner there. Yeah. But like you juggling so many things at the show, you know. Managing, managing your own fighters, making sure other trainers are happy, running the show. You know, I have that, I have that corner because it somewhat isolates me. And number one, people have to come at me from front on. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if, they, if they're going to come to me, I, I can look up, I can see who's coming, I can assess whatever situation is going to come. Um, and, you know, maybe just someone asking a question or plus I can oversee the room a bit and, yep. and help anyone that needs it. You know, if, someone, if someone's struggling, I can see, you know, and offer support. Um, you know, it's. I'd love to, to just be um, sitting ringside as a promoter and, and calling the shots, but I, I have to be hands on. I, I don't want to run a show and then tell my fighters, I'm running a show, so I, I can't do that for you. You know, yeah. we've gone through the process together. I'm, I'm going to wrap their hands. I'm going to talk to them just before we go out. You know, we huddle up. We talk about, you know, that, that one last thing. You know, I know some fighters need to be assured up until the fight other fighters just will get you know put their headphones on and just get in their own head you learn their little traits of, of what to do and when to do it but the reason i have that corner is because number one i can organize myself so i i can everything's within arm's reach yep i tell the boys that's where we are everyone can you know set themselves up around um i have a runner so generally so i have my phone on me so even you know if I need something or I'll send a runner out and I go, tell me if the queue's still at the front door, how many people are waiting to get in pre, pre show. Um, you know, does the martial arts board need anything? You know, has the DJ yeah. got his food? How many times does your phone go off in a fight show? <laughs> Not as much as it used to. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think people, people know I'm busy. They get the so idea. They, they respect that. But you know, sometimes, you know, the, the one thing also that I have to, people go, well, just turn your phone off. I can't, I, I'm responsible for my, or well, was responsible for my parents that were quite elderly and, and ill. And it doesn't matter what's happening in my world. If my mum is having a heart problem, nothing else matters to me, man. I'm dealing, I've got to go to that, you know, so I can be doing whatever it is. But if my family needs me, you know, and my mum, my, my late state stepfather, who's um, unfortunately passed away uh, not so long ago, I knew they were both not well. I knew it's night time. There can be problems. Yeah. My phone has to be, I've got to be on call because, you know, I, I won't entrust that to anyone and any, everything else can wait. But I've had to deal with situations where I've had a show and, and my parents have been in hospital quite unwell. So, you know, doctors might call you or something might happen. So I've got to deal with that situation as it, as it presents as well. Yeah. There's nothing more important than family. Um, and you know, that, that's, that's my thing with, especially when it comes to my parents, my daughter, my, yeah, my fiance, but they're all there, but the, my elders, my, my parents that needed me and still do to this day, um, I, I'm never going to, I'm never going to put anything more important than that. 
Um, and then obviously, you know, sponsors might have a problem. You know, people might have a ticketing problem. Sometimes that arises too. And I'm like, oh, just go to the front and speak to this, you know, see, see my missus or, or see this person and they'll sort it out for you. So I, I always want to be um, accessible to people that support me and love me. That, that's something that I don't shy away from. I, I, you know, when it doesn't matter if I'm busy, if someone needs me and, and they, they're someone important to me, you have to make time, you know, uh, and that's why I, I set myself up. And there's, yeah. there's little things that I'm quite impressed you notice. I see, I see <laughs> you a lot know. of things, mate. This, this is my chance to actually bring it up and ask you the questions I've always been curious about. Yeah, thank you. This was one of my first times working with you too at the ball cow seminar that you ran at the Melbourne Sports Aquatic Centre. This was one of the few and last times I actually got starstruck working with someone of this calibre. What was it like for you bringing in a superstar like him? Um, well, that was all done with you know through Andrew Parnham. So thank you, Andrew, for helping me to, with to, you know entrusting me with that seminar in Melbourne. You know, um, and it was great. It was great to be given that opportunity. Um, there's a lot of stuff that, that happens behind the scenes that you guys don't know about. Um, and when you talk about, you know, getting starstruck and so forth, I don't, it doesn't really happen to me because I've worked, as I said, with, with looking after celebrities for so long and I've seen them in, in green, in the green room or I've been backstage with them or I've been to their hotel rooms and, you know, seen that they're just people that have insecurities. Some of them are really, just not nice people you know yeah. they put a persona out there but they're really not good human beings man you know this is where celebrity status um you know and people are built up to be these demigods and i wouldn't want them to be my mate i wouldn't be friends with them i, I work with them because i i have to and because it's commercial commercial reality sometimes or when i was doing security and bodyguarding you know, you get assigned a job and it doesn't matter what happens. You, you have to look out for the welfare of that person and you have to treat them with respect and put up with their shit and, you know, be a, it's almost like you're a bit of a PA in some ways. You yeah. get them this and get them that. And so it's like, man, and some people will ask nicely and other people will demand and treat you like shit. So the fact that someone's a celebrity or a good fighter or a good actor or a good singer means nothing to me. It means nothing to me. I, I'll rather talk to someone that's, you know, homeless person that's a good person rather than someone who's you know multi-millionaire you know rock star it's like if you're a shit you're a shit you know <laughs> if you're a good person i'll give you my time you know the book house seminar was quite challenging because the way his schedule was when he come to australia i think he did a seminar he, he flew to melbourne in the afternoon for that seminar which was quite rushed i he think there a was like a now delay too dude he, he was in sydney he did something in sydney in the morning I think he flew in the day before he did Sydney in the morning. Then he had to fly to do Melbourne. Then he had to fly out of Melbourne, go to Canberra. Then from Canberra, to, it was like, they, they, you know, he was, wow. his schedule was hectic. I would, you know, there was a few things that were, you know, were, were promised that, that weren't delivered. Um, you know, and just because someone's a good fighter doesn't mean they can run a good seminar. Let me tell you that too, because I've had, you know, without going name and names, but there's people that have, I've done seminars with or had seminars done, they've got no idea how to do a seminar. They'll run a technique for 20 minutes or I've they'll explain there. the basics. And it's like, dude, you can't, you got to give people what they want. And I suppose that's where my experience with running seminars comes into, into play because I'll, I'll let it happen. I'll be most respectful. And then I'll go up and the, the, the best suggestion that, that I make that actually I've got, I have to credit Mark Hunt for this. Because Mark Hunt came to my gym when he did the seminar. And Mark Hunt is such a champion bloke, you know. He's never forgotten the fact that, you know, when I was commentating, you know, with, with, or, or, even when he was just an up-and-coming fighter, he was, he was always nice and we are always very complimentary. And, you know, we realised he had a big heart. But anyway, long story short, he came to my gym to do the seminar. And uh, he said to me, I said, man, you know, with the seminar, whatever people pay, you know, we'll split it or we'll do an 80-20 deal or whatever it was. At the end of the seminar, he goes to me, Hammer, you've done so much for me. I don't want, I don't want a cent. I don't need it. He was doing quite well. He goes, you take it. You know, if you donate it, do whatever you want. And there's a couple of people that have done that with me over the years. And that, that just speaks to, to the caliber of person that they are. They're not money hungry. They come, they give back. They love doing the seminar. But the, the one thing I got from Mark was 
when, when he started his seminar, it's like, I'm not going to teach you guys to jab and cross and do the, you know, the basics. He goes, you do that in your gym. Your coaches should be teaching you that anyway. I'm not going to show you that. He goes, what do you want me to show you? You know, what, what do you want, what do you want to ask me? And that was like a pivotal moment for me because he handed power over to the people that actually were paying to be there to see him. So he'd give them a voice and he, and, and I saw everyone's faces. First it was shock. And then it was like elation to the fact of men, I, I can actually ask him what That's this awesome. stuff that I, I want. And, and, you know, then it was like, all right, he, he showed one thing. Someone said, oh, you know, if you've got a big guy on top of you, how do you escape? He showed that. Then it was something else. Then it was something else. And it just made that seminar just, just the ultimate seminar back in the day. So I've passed that on to a couple of, of guys. And I, and I know you won't mind me saying, but uh, Anderson Silva, you know, that was one, one thing that I, I said to Anderson. Because Anderson was trying to be all things to all people you know at that time and I, I said to Anderson mate Anderson you know you're doing some stuff that's a bit here there you know basic or these basic for them you know a bit hard for them I said can we just try this and and that was when you know he did that push kick to the face that was my question I said yeah how did you how did you work that push kick to the face that 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 got Vita Belfort you know and he showed it and even I learned something then he, he taught me distancing he goes, if you can touch their hand, you can kick them in the face with a push kick to the face. Even I learned from asking that question. And then another question come and another question and another question. So, you know, that was Anderson seminar was great when we, when we just shifted direction to, to giving the people at the seminar a bit of a say in what is actually presented. And the one thing I'll say with the Bokau seminar is there was like he, he ran, I think he ran a, a, a body kick, you know, a punch punch body kick technique for like 20 minutes you know and then and i went and said to andrew but andrew can we change it up rather because you know people were starting to lose focus and and get a bit bored but you know the book was he was he was a bit burnt out he was jet lagged he was fatigued in some ways i believe he was over being there um so he just did what he had to do and then you know the big thing is these days, people do seminars more to get a photo than to learn anything, to be honest with it's you. It's a photo op. You know, I've it's been to photo op seminars all... too. So I've seen it's it happen all... both ways, you know? Yeah, it's all about getting the picture for the gram at the end of it, man. Not about learning anything these days in a lot of ways. And as, as the photos were happening, he saw people line up and they just go, oh, no, we've got to go. And he basically just you know, had to walk out because they were late for a flight. Mm. Things, you know, things were sort of went a little bit sideways. And you know, people are coming up to me going, oh, what about my photo? And I'm like, go chase him, <laughs> get him in the car park. And he had like literally probably 30 people running after him, which is, I laughed about, but <laughs> I'm sure he didn't find it funny. But I'm like, you know what, bugger it. It's like, yeah. you know, I, I, I tried and I, you know, and that should have been part of it. But, you know, eventually we, we, it all worked out and it was a great day and I was glad to do it. But I learned a lot even from that experience on how to run it, you know, timing getting getting more time for photos because that was almost the transition of um, we'll get a group photo and everyone will be happy but no nah, everyone wanted that individual photo and they all want it for social media was you know back in my day you'd just be glad to be learning off, off of you know yeah. a legendary photo let's go back to what you said it's all for the grams and we've both done a few seminars even together as well and sometimes yeah. you see people are just there for the gram they're just there for the photos they're just there to get their t-shirts or um gloves signed 100%. And how many times have we seen people waiting at the front of your gym just to get that photo up? That they, they don't even know you. They don't even pay for the seminar. They know yeah. they're not going to be there. It's a yeah. weird dynamic, yeah. but at the end of the day, I'm a martial artist. You're a martial artist. You're there to learn from the best. Just to see. Like to, to see, you know, you, you, you're going to learn from people. And I always had this, this mentality when I was learning. I always wanted to see how I went against the black belt when I was, you know, a novice. I always wanted to not test my, well, test myself, but not in a disrespectful way. Like I'll punch that guy out because he's a black belt and I reckon I can beat him. It wasn't about that. It was about measuring up against someone and going, if I can, if I can stand and, and survive for a round with this person, man, I'll take, I'm taking that away, you know? And I, and I, I've always said that with river and I, you know, my fighters, part of the reason I bring guys like Georges St. Pierre or Anderson Silva or Steven Seagal, whoever it might be, 
to my gym, which is quite costly and, and it's a bit of a task, is just for them to stand in front of, of, my, of the fighters and go two arms, two leg, one head. They're not that big. They're not that scary. They're just very dedicated and talented people that have applied themselves wholeheartedly to, to, their, to their art and to their passion. And they don't take shortcuts. They don't make excuses. That's what they are. And you can be like that too because they're just people, blood and bone, like all of us. Yep. So it's, it's the mindset that I want to just pass on to the guys that, that come to the seminars, especially from my gym, that we're all just people. And they're just, some people just get more opportunity than others in this world, unfortunately. That's, that's the way it is. Yep. Perfect. The Steven Seagal seminar, the one of your more recent seminars. I'm not going to thank you for this one because you actually allowed my dad to watch on the sidelines. And my dad, you know, he grew up in the 60s, uh, 70s, 80s and loved his movies. Yeah. And it was a real honor for him to see Steven live. What was it like learning from someone like him? Well, Steven was um, an interesting fellow because he's such an, you know, he's an, an eclectic mix, mix of people that come to the seminar and, and, uh, and, and were curious about him including me, you know, like I grew up watching Under Siege and Nico Above the Law and all these kick-ass movies, you know, flipping people. And it was back in the day, there was Van Damme, there was Cigar, a little bit of Jackie yeah. Chan. You know, there was a lot of, you know, martial arts was really a popular thing on the big, on the silver screen back then, you know, on the big screen. So there's always been the doubt. There's always been the question of how legit, how legitimate um, movie stars that do martial arts are. You know, Chuck Norris, Dolph Lundgren, you know, John claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal, Jackie Chan. These are all iconic martial artists that Westerners know. There's, there's obviously a lot more that are more, you know, well known. In, in They're the, the main in the ones Asian that come to your mind. Yeah. And, and having met every one of those people and not only seen, you know, how they are as a person, which I find quite interesting that we, we mentioned, but also seeing what their actual how their martial art mentality is, you know, how are they, you know, when they explain themselves, when they demonstrate. And I've got to say, I was a witch Seagal because I heard so much. And I actually had people messaging me, you know, that, that had worked with him in the past said, man, don't demo, don't do demos with him. You're going to get hurt. He has no control. He'll, you know, he, he's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a, there was a lot of conjecture around Stephen before that seminar. And, and it, in my position, you know, I was like, man, this guy, if, if he tries to, if he tries to do something, I'm going to try and have a crack, you know, yeah. like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let myself be, be broken down either. So, but what I, what, what I found or what transpired was I met a legitimate martial artist, you know, he's a bit quirky and he's got his own way, but you know, half the people I know are a little bit quirky. Um, but when I saw him flip people, legit in with my own eyes like literally you know wrist lock them and and turn them because if they didn't if they didn't roll with his lock he break. would have popped their elbow he would have popped their shoulder it was an inevitable that they would have become injured so it's lucky they knew how to break fall or how to roll fall um and i i was like here's the shit he's legit this guy's he's older and he's you know he's got injuries and so forth as we all do but as a martial artist, and, and I sat with him in this very office, just me and him, and I was like, uh, you know, when there's just two people in the room, the, 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 you know, as I said, as I've worked with a lot of people, the fakeness goes because there's no crowd to, there's no crowd to impress. He's just talking to me. He can be as nice to me, or he can be as shit to me as he likes, because it's just me and him. Yeah. But he was actually really nice. When it was just me and him, He's an absolute gentleman. He was respectful. He was complimentary. He didn't need to, 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 say, to say shit to me. He, was, he got his money, did his job, but he actually hung out and had, you know, had his bottle of water and he just hung out and we just talked. And then, you know, a few other colleagues come in and we all had a good conversation. And it was like, he's actually a decent bloke. You know, he's, you know we've all done things in the past that, that people might question, but you don't know his life. You don't know what he's been through. So I go, it's not, to me, it was all right. I can only yeah. speak for what I saw. I go, credible martial artist. He could actually kick ass. He's a, he's a big bugger as well. He's huge. And, and man, he was, he was nice to me and he was, he was very complimentary. And, you know, I, I would say 
meeting Stephen and, and getting that so insight to him, there's only one thing that topped that. Only one thing, Chuck Norris, man. Like <laughs> the day I spent with Chuck Norris, so Dan Deltz was lucky enough to invite me to Sydney. On, it was like a Sunday night. They go, if you want to come and meet Chuck uh, tomorrow, be in Sydney. And I'm like, it's Sunday night in Melbourne. Yeah. And I was like, I've got too much responsibility, blah, 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 blah. And I was lucky, you know, a couple of people were like, man, just do it. You know, even if it doesn't work out, what are you going to lose an airfare, you know? So I jumped on the plane, landed in Sydney real early in the morning, went to the hotel. Richard Norton was there, you know, he's a, he's a good friend as well. You know, so Dan and Richard and, and all that, we all, we went out on a boat and, you know, I hung with Chuck Norris for the day. And again, wow. like, I can't believe, I can't, I can't tell you how much of a nice human being, genuine person that, that Chuck Norris is. Obviously older now and he's not, you know, he, he has, he, he has his, um, you know, everyone ages and, and in some ways they're not as sharp as they were in, in certain things. But when it comes to just a good country bloke making you feel like he's... I met him. I spoke to him for, you know, 10 minutes at the start. I feel like I've known him for, for 20 years. Yeah. It made me so comfortable. And, and as the day progressed, it, you know, become more... It was Things just were more and more amicable. And his wife was so lovely. And, you know, the experiences we shared for that day... Man, I like my, my, I told my mum, and she's like, oh, Texas Walker, you, you, you've got a picture with Texas Walker, you know, yeah. my stepdad when he was alive, you know, it was, it, was, it was a joy to meet him. It was such an experience to share, you know, the day with someone like that, that I never thought as a kid watching Chuck Norris and Enter the Dragon that that would ever happen to me, man. It was like, that, that someone said to me, this is the closest you'll get, this is the closest you'll ever get to meeting Bruce Lee. I'm like, it's yeah, a fair it's point. True. That's yeah. a fair point, you know. So, you know, I, that was that was a, a day I'll, I'll remember and fondly for the rest of my life also. That's great to hear, man. Your famous wall of fame. Now, when I first saw this <laughs> at the old gym, I was thinking there's no way you're going to move that to the new gym. But somehow <laughs> you made it work. And it's probably the only gym in Melbourne or maybe in Australia that I've seen have something like this. And it's, it's great for guests or members just to walk by and just see who's been past the gym, who yeah. we came in contact with. Yeah. And, and it, uh, it, there's a number of reasons I did it. Number one, it was like, yeah, I got the idea from, you know, you go to like Planet Hollywood or you go to some cafes or restaurants where famous people go, they sign plates or they sign, sign the wall, you know? Yeah. So I thought I, I want to do that. You know, I'm going to let, I'm going to let it, I don't want to sign a piece of paper that is, I'm going to go, you're here. This is my house, you know. Who's who? Are you going to let to write on the wall in your house? <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's like if, for someone to write on the wall in my house, it got to be pretty important. It got to be a special occasion. So, well, you know, when I had it at the old gym, was op the grand opening. The first person to write on the wall was Danny Green, and he wrote such a beautiful message, you know. Uh, and then Wayne Parr wrote something really lovely at the old gym, and you know, all the trainers that come through after the the grand opening, they all they all left me such such messages that if I have a down day or I'm like, you know, just I walk past, I look and I'm like, I achieved something. I, I, I can drop off tomorrow, but look at that wall. And that's not only, you know, a nice thing for people to look at and actually, you know, it's got a little bit of celebrity about it. Yeah. But for me, it's like a, it's like a trophy of my hard work where I'm like, it's cost me tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to create. Um, and and that that is a, a stamp of approval. That is a, a moniker to to what what I set out to do. I set out to create something that was special and get the best you know martial artists and and the, you know the, the most revered people I can to come to the gym, share knowledge first and foremost, and secondly leave us a nice memento of their time at the gym by going hey I was here, good people, good place you know, see you again soon. And, you know, Dolph Lundgren, Alistair Overeem, Sam Greco, you know, Hoist Gracie uh, signed the wall at the old gym, yeah. you know, Chuck Liddell, the list goes on, you know, Scott Adkins, you know, Michael Joy White, and on and on and on. I can keep going with all the, all the greats, you know, that have signed the wall, Billy Dib, you know, for the boxing heads. And, and it, uh, you know, when I left the old gym, I'm like, I'm going to take that wall with me, man. Like <laughs> one way or the other, that thing's coming with me. And where I put it in this gym, one way or the other, that wall will come with me. It's, yeah. I've, I've built it so I can take it out and take it with me. If I cut, have to cut it in pieces, it's going, to, it's going to be in the boot of my car as I drive out of here. If, I, if something ever happens, I've got to leave here, you know? So yeah, yeah it, it is something. 
and it, and it, people walk in and they wonder about my credibility. I go look over there, and that tells you where we sit, where we sit, you know, in the business as well. Yeah, perfect. Now, just going back to the fights, this was taking that size show rebelling at one of the rebelling Muay Thais with Brock. What's it like as yeah. a trainer backstage, win, lose, or draw after a fight? Like I said, you're there from the very start into the fight and then after the fights. So what's it like with you guys and the team in the change room? Um, you know, and I look at that picture and I see uh, Jordan Coe there in the background too. Um, you know, may rest in peace. And, you know, so it's, it's, you know, the, the thing that I say to my fighters is when you're going to go out to fight, remember all of the sacrifice you've done to get here. Remember the nights you didn't want to train. Remember the pain in training. Remember the personal sacrifice. Remember the physical sacrifice. Remember the time you put in. Remember your dieting. Remember how hard your weight cut was if you had a hard weight cut. Now, don't make all of that be for nothing by being weak of mind when you step in the ring. You understand? Like the person opposite you is there to take that away from you and make all of that be a waste of time. And I'd be damned if anyone's going to make us waste our time and take away our reputation and take away the opportunity to progress to the next level, no matter what that might be for them, because you don't, you're not going to go forward if, if this person in front of you takes, takes your will. You know, if you have two fighters, same weight, same phys physical capabilities, same skill, same fitness, and you put them together for a fight, who's going to win? What's going to separate them at that point? What's going to separate them is whoever is mentally tougher, whoever is not going to give up. Doesn't matter what. You get a sore leg, you get a sore arm, you get a sore head, whatever. Whether you win or lose, you're still going to be sore, but you're going to have less pain if you're a winner because <laughs> you'll have the elation of winning. So we're going to be worse if you're sore and you're a loser. So go in and make it be, give it your all, man. Like, you know, literally, if, if, you, if, you, if you're going to be beaten, it's just because they're so much better or the judges are Muppets, you know, and you get ripped, um, which, you know, that's happened. Happens sometimes. Um, sometimes that happens, sure. Um, but never, ever let, let it come down to you become weak of mind and you made all that sacrifice be for nothing because that's the shit you can't forgive yourself for afterwards. Win or lose is anyone can win or lose. Yeah. But, you know, you, there, there's times you will lose, 100%. But you know what? Don't make it be easy for that person to take, to take your pride because that's what they're trying to do. Not only are they trying to beat you, they're trying to say to everyone there, your friends, your family, you know, the crowd, I'm better than this guy. He's nothing. I'm everything. You know, no one's going to do that to me. You know, to my last breath, doesn't matter if they're bigger, they got big, bigger, better, whatever. If someone's going to come and try and take something away from me, I'll fight to the, I'll fight to the end, you know. Um, with all my resolve in whatever capacity I can to not roll over. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm challenged in business now, you know, like I built this place and I've got within 5k, you know, 5k radius, there's something like 30 gyms. I've got three gyms opening up within 200 meters of me because everyone's trying to take what's mine in this area. And I'm fighting for all I can because I'm not going to just roll over and go, Oh, well, they got more money, you got this or that. Yeah. No, it's like I'll, I'll, I'll go down swinging, man, in whatever aspect of life. And I expect that same commitment from my fighters. If you can't give me that commitment, don't waste my time and don't step in the ring and don't embarrass yourself and me and what we stand for by going in half assed Because then you're going to have another fight when you get out of the ring. It's going to be with me for not doing your all, you know? That's a great piece of advice every fighter should hear, or even business owner. Back to Rebellion. River had just beaten Andy Uniku, who was also similar building structure, similar record, and it was a great fight too. What was it like at this moment when the fight was called off? Look, when that was elation because the pressure, and and I know, you know, we did our homework on Andy, and he's a tough kid. You know, yeah. his, his sister fights, it, they're tough, man. Like that was a, that was a, and I said it, I think. Uh, with the rebellion when we did the pre-fight interviews 
that's a worthy fight. You know, that's a worthy title fight. That's not bullshit really title good fight right there. That was two, you know, two athletes at their peak fighting for the ultimate prize and something they'll remember for a long time and it's going to set them apart. So, you know, I know River was a little bit nervous fighting him because that kid's got resolve. He's got power and he's not there to make friends. You know, River's, a, as I said, essentially a very nice person and wants to be friends with anyone. And he didn't want to be his mate. He want to punch him up and go back to Queensland and say, Queensland Muay Thai is better than Victorian Muay Thai. And that gym, you know, Hammer's gym's a big gym and they got all the blah, blah, but we kicked their ass. That's what he was there to do. And his trainer was there to do it. And they may say, no, we were just there to fight. And I'm like, that's bullshit. You know, people fight my fighters. They fight my reputation. And they all trying to take us down. So I know when we get in the ring, it's like a victory is always a little bit sweeter if you beat someone from Hammers, because we carry a bit of... You beat Hammer as well. Yeah, that's, that's all. So, they, you know, they try that. They try it on. And, and good luck to them. You know, I, I don't underestimate anyone. So when that was called off, to me, it was like, we, we make a statement. We make a statement nationally, because, you know, River, in some ways, could have been a little bit the underdog in that fight too. Because they're like, oh, I said, you know, he, he hasn't had the hard fights like Andy and this and that. And I'm like... You don't know what he's done and what he hasn't done. We, we, we leave it, we'll leave it to the fight. And we left it to the fight. But I also believe, giving credit where credit's due, it was a little bit home ground advantage, you know, because I'm not an idiot either. He's fighting River in Melbourne with a partisan crowd on Rebellion. Um, and, you know, he's got, you know, he's got me standing there. He's got my team standing there. You know, out the back, you know, they, you know you, when you fight in someone's backyard or in, on their home ground advantage, you've got to be pretty, you've got to be pretty um, ballsy to just walk through all that bullshit and go, you know, I don't give a shit. In the ring, it's just me and him. And we face that too, you know, now. We've, we've gone to other people's backyards and fought. So I know that feeling. But I, I think Andy was, you know, he's young. And I think that fight will only benefit him if, if he keeps going because he's, a, he's yeah. a kid with a big heart. He's got a lot of ability. He's tough as nails. And, you know, River's, River's all of that too, but River's got the skill and the finesse and, you know, he's got the self-belief um, that, you know, he's growing with, with every challenge as well. So that was a really good... Um, and, and my emotion was very raw there because... Man, I, I was, I was you're a very vocal. You're a very vocal trainer too, but in this particular fight, I noticed it was a bit more raw than usual. Yeah, well, man, I was, yeah, as I said, I'm, I, I fight the fight with my fighters. I, I don't sit there and, you know, I'm not sitting back going, oh, if they lose, if they lose, I lose. If they lose, you know, if they get hurt, I hurt. That's why I train my fighters with more of an evasive fight style. Because I don't want them to stand there and get elbowed in the head and trade up. It's good for the crowd, yeah. but the crowd's not getting elbowed in the face. The crowd's not getting stitched up after, you know. I've had fighters that have tried that, and I've sat in casualty wards for, for six hours waiting for their nose to be put straight and their faces to get stitched up. It's not fun, you know. Everyone's, everyone loves it, and they you know, get pictures and, and all that. But the reality is, it fucking hurts, <laughs> and it's not good. Health-wise, it's not good. So if you can have a style that's, you know, make a miss, make them pay, look look good, still still pressure when you need to, not not run away, pressure, and then move out. Pressure, move out. Angles, you know, it's a, it's a physical game of chess, and the fighter, you know, my my original Shihan, you know, Shihan Eddie Emin, who's who's one of the highly most highly credentialed Kukushin exponents in the world now, he said to me at one point. You know, you know, he goes, I look at fighters and sometimes you look at one, he's got a broken nose, his eye closed. Look at the other one, he's got a cut on his head, his face is all banged up. And then they're going to tell me someone won. He goes, <laughs> how can someone win? They're both bashed up. He goes, if you look at someone and they've, and they've got no injuries after a fight and they, they, you know, they had a full fight and they win and they're not injured, that's the real winner. And I take that, I take that to the bank because... I want my fighters to have long careers. I don't want them, when they're my age, to be forgetting, you know, shit and, you know, dealing with, you know, cognitive issues. I've been part of brain studies. Man, I've looked the inside, ins and outs of this whole sport. 
I walk around sometimes on cold mornings hurting because of the arthritis in my body from all the crazy shit I did when I was younger doing martial arts and breaking stuff and all of that. I want my fighters to, to get through their fight careers with the least amount of damage, but the most amount of success. That's, that's what I live for. It's a testament to your training methods too, because I don't remember seeing River that badly damaged in his face. So, you know, he's still very fresh after all these fights too. Yeah. And he's, had, he's fought some, you know, he's fought some, you know, tough boys from WA and Queensland. They're there. They don't want to cut his head open, you know. Liam McNeil, that fight with Liam McNeil on Rebellion, that was a cracker as well. That was nuts. Liam was at his peak, man. You know, and he, Liam, you know, he was knocking people out. He was elbowing people's heads, cutting them. He was taller than River. He was rangier than River. He had probably better elbow striking than River. But unfortunately, Liam, you know, Liam, uh, you know, that fight didn't go the way he thought it was going to go. And, you know, yet again, River sort of upset the party there a little bit. And to that person that threw the cup at me when we were in the ring. You never forget, dude. You, you never I forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I watched that the other night thinking, I wonder if Hammer's still thinking about that bottle and who threw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I still like to know. I don't forget, man. I've got a lot yeah. of memories. Someone, someone's going to be that disrespectful to me after we won a fight fairly and throw shit at me in the ring. Come and say something to me outside the ring after, you know. I may be old, but I can still throw them too. <laughs> <laughs> and this brings us to our last photo. Our very first Warriors Way. I don't think I told you this, but I was actually at the very first Warriors Way in the crowd because um, semi-main event, you had field life fighting and I was there to see yeah, yeah. Still, And I wasn't working properly at the time. I was just was, had my camera. I was slowly trying to make my way into the, ring, into the ringside crowd. Um, yeah, it was a different time. Uh, it was a different time. 2010, it was all new, I believe. There was kickboxing, box. Like. Yeah, kickboxing, boxing. Yeah. There was even mixed yeah. martial arts. Chris Bradford actually had the first mixed yep. martial arts fights in the ring. Not many people know that, hey. Yeah, that's right. So Chris, Chris was there, you know, and uh, this is pre-buff days, really, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, doing MMA. And, uh, you know, that we, we wanted to do everything. That's why I didn't call it something Muay Thai. It was called Warrior's Way because everyone that got in the gets in there everyone that gets in the ring to me is a warrior mm. and you have to have a certain way about your your lifestyle about your mentality about your ethos to 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 be a fighter so it was like you know you say the way of the warriors but warriors way was was the name that, that i come up with and you know that show was done with carl drapo who's my very close friend um and we you know we was like you know what We'll do everything. We'll do boxing. We'll do kickboxing. We'll do MMA. We'll do Muay Thai. We'll do whatever people want to see. We're going to do it. And in theory, it's a good idea. But in practice, it doesn't work. Because boxing people don't want to see kickboxing. Yeah. They don't like it. They don't want to see it. You know, kickboxing people or Muay Thai people, even more so, really don't give a shit about MMA or, you know, rolling around wrestling on the ground. It's, a pure, it's for the purest. It's, each of the disciplines in some ways, you know, has its own following for certain reasons. Um, and it's hard to transcend that and bring all those businesses together and go, here you go. It's like, you know, it's like a, having a restaurant that has Asian and Italian and, you know, Australian cuisine and, you know, yeah. uh, vegetarian. It's like, you know, I just want to go somewhere where I can just have my favorite food. Well, it's like fight sports is like, I want to go somewhere where I can just see my favorite fighting style. So that's why it's, it's sort of morphed to now being predominantly full Muay Thai. But I, I, I will, you know, occasionally, if I have to, uh, put on a K1 rules fight because fighters are still looking for that. And, of course, with Glory and River Fighting on Glory, you know, it, it is exciting if it's, if it's done the right way. But going back to that first Warriors way, did I ever think it would evolve to where it is now? Probably not. Um, maybe I thought it was going to be bigger. I don't know. You know, like every promoter has, you know, the delusions of grandeur where they think they're going to be the next Don King or, you know, Dana White. The reality is that's probably not the case. The reality is all we can do is be the best version of ourselves and promote our shows to be the best that they can be for the, the faithful few, from you know, sponsors that back up, you know, because let's face it, you know, Gasoline Alley, those guys sponsor the show because of me, because of 
the brand recognition, sure. But do they sell as many motorbikes as much as money they're giving me? Probably not. They do it because they love the sport. They love the fighters. They love the atmosphere. They love to support me. They love that, you know, they get a little bit of a brand push with it. Um, they're lucky they get a picture with the ring girls at the end of the night. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, but is it, a, is it a commercial decision that is going to give them a return on investment? For any sponsors, probably not. It's, it's the passionate business people that come because they want to see the sport survive and maybe even flourish a little by their financial support. So I've been blessed that I've got a few people that have come to me and supported me um, long term, like Cafe Oji from the first show. The guys, Every show. I don't, know, I don't know how many people go to his cafe or his restaurant, but definitely not enough to cover what he's done for me. And he does it because he loves the sport. You know, he gets his table brings his friends, he enjoys the show, he goes home. And, and you know, I think it, the, the fans, the fighters, they really should, you know, they, they've got to kiss the butt a little bit of the, of the sponsors because they take a hit pretty much on every show they sponsor. That's, that's, you know, for the most, you know, or they may break even if they're lucky. Mm. It's not a commercial. They don't do it for commercial gain. They do it for love of the sport and to support us all. So, you know, you've got to give sponsors the ultimate, uh, you know, the, the utmost respect. And my last question, if you were to go back and redo Warriors Way again from the first show, would you have done anything differently? And do you have any advice for anyone starting their own promotion for the first time? Um, yeah, I've got, I've got a, <laughs> the advice for someone starting a promotion for the first time is probably don't. If you're, if you're married, <laughs> you've got to have a very supportive partner. Um, look, that's, a, that's such a, it's a tough one. It's a good question though. Because that was at a different. time when a lot of things was changing. Mixed martial arts was becoming more prominent. Yeah. There was a big push for the cage. So there was that big separation. Because back when I was fighting sure. too, I was fighting in the ring in, in the May rules and it was seen as a spectacle, seen as no rules, you know, cage fighting. And eventually we got our ways and everyone split off. And then, yeah. you know, the Muay Thai scene and the MMA scene sort of split. Yeah, exactly. Um, Look, I think I've, I've played with the idea of, and you've you got to remember, before Warriors Way, I promoted Evolution Melbourne. I, I worked quite closely with Josh Sexton and Nugget when, we, when Evo was at its peak in Queensland. You know, I was the general manager of, of Kickboxer Magazine and Blitz, and, you know, I was doing the, 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 um, the, the scheduling for the, the kickboxing on Fox Sports. You know, I was working with Fox Sports executives to pick the best shows in the country to put on TV. So I've been at, you know, worked on these big shows and I've seen what goes into it. And I suppose with, I would have hoped that I could have grown Warriors Way to be like that. But the commercial reality, especially after we did Evolution in Melbourne, everyone's like, yeah, do Evo in Melbourne. We'll come, we'll come, we'll do this, we'll do that. Well, you know what? Ticket sales tells the story. So if I went to a venue that was the capacity to probably fit three and a half thousand people. And I think we got, you know, maybe 1500. So we were 50, 50% 50 capacity. Admittedly, Wayne Parr was supposed to be main event on the show, but he, 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 had, he had an eye injury and he rang me. I still remember the phone call from Wayne. He goes, Hammer, I've got some bad news, blah, blah, blah. I went to see my doctor. My doctor has advised me not to fight because I've got potentially an eye injury. And if it gets any worse, I could go blind. And he goes, but if you want me to fight, I'll fight. Because I don't want to let you and Nugget and, and everyone down. And I thought, you now I've got two ways to go here. I can be the old man, you're a fighter, just get in and fight. We've, we've got all the posters, all the, all the pre-fight hype had been built around, around John Wayne. Yeah. But John Wayne's a mate as well. And I'm like, there's something bigger than all of it. And that's someone's well-being. You know, if I put him in and he loses his sight, you know, he's going to have a young it's family. He's going to live. The, man, it's like, how am I going to forgive myself? So, of course, I've said to him, JW, don't worry about it, man. And he, and he was, he's actually he would have done it. If I, I could have, I'd say that point in the conversation where you have a conversation with someone and I know it would have taken one or two words for me to say, oh, man, I, you know, really, can you just do it? And if, if you get hit in the eye hard, I'll, I'll tell the referee to stop the fight. But then I'm not going to be honest to the crowd. We could have, I could have put Wayne in. This is, this is a little bit of insight for everyone watching here. Promoter business speak. 
We've seen, how many how many fights have we've seen built up bigger than Ben Hur, and then they fizzle out? Why? A number of reasons. That fighter could be getting in for the payday, having an injury, and the promoter is well, you know, is a party to all that, and just getting that fight to happen just because he wants bums on seats. But with all good conscience, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it to Wayne. We could have you know, manipulated the situation and said, man, get in. I'll tell the opponent not to, not to hit you in the eye too much. I'll give him five grand extra to stay away from your head, get it to two, three rounds. Then, you know, you take a fall or something happens, a doctor will call it off, call it a no contest. Any of that is possible. Any of that could have been done. But I love the sport too much. And I, I love, you know, what it stands for too much. And more importantly than that, nothing is worth my reputation. Nothing is worth me doing something like that to tarnish what I was trying to build and what the Evolution brand was back then and what I stood for as credibility. And on top of that, take all of that away. Nothing is worth seeing a friend get hurt because there's always another show, there's always another day. Well, then there wasn't another show after that because we took a big financial loss. And again, you know, there was a team of people involved, including Carl Draper in that. And we all like, you know what, for the work we put into that, to the return, if we're going to do shows, we're going to do them on much more of a smaller, cost-effective, uh, you know, proposition. And that's, how, that's why we went to do Warriors Way, because we, we tried to go too big too soon, and it bit us in the ass, because one little thing brought the whole, the whole you know, deck of cards came down because of one little bend, one little kink in one of the cards. So I learned a valuable lesson there. Don't, go, don't get ahead of yourself. Start small, build up get good people around you. And, and that's probably the other hard part with promoting now is I've done a lot of things for a lot of fighters and a lot of coaches and trainers. And sometimes, and I'm sure Sai does Rebellion and, you know, you know Paul De McCauley does his shows, you know, Eruption up there in Queensland, the bigger shows now and the guys in Perth. Sometimes fighters and trainers have very short memories. They <laughs> ask the world, they want the titles, they want everything. They want the weight cut to be their way. You know, they, they want you to negotiate everything for them. But when it comes to giving back sometimes to help a promoter out, the memories are very short. There's some, there's some camps go above and beyond, man, that they turn up, show in, show out, give me a list of fighters. If I'm stuck for a matchup, they try and make something happen for me. But then there's other people that are just takers. They take, they take, they take. And then if you get the shits, you're the worst person in the world. But, you know, one thing that this whole situation now with this pandemic has, has shown me is when the chips are down and life turns on its head sometimes for people, you'll see the people that will be there for you and will step up and help and lend support and, you know, do what, what is needed. And then you'll see the people that will just forget about whatever is, as you know, has been done in the past and all that goodwill is quickly forgotten you know so i think working with the right teams working with the right people that will appreciate you know your promotions and appreciate you flying in off like people from new zealand fly people from thailand off like people for anywhere sometimes to get a match because there's just who are you going to get to fight alexi petrullius in melbourne these days you know who are you going to get to fight some of these a grade who, who's going to fight who in melbourne is going to fight ramesh now realistically not many so you invest in your fighters and I don't, I don't have contracts with them because my word is my bond. So if I'm going to fly someone in for the A grade fighters and I know I'm going to lose money on that fight because sometimes you fly people in, you got meal money, you got flights, accommodation, you know, medical expenses from the board, this, that, the other. And then they, they, their ticket sales is not going to cover their fight. So I'm doing that to make the fight happen for the crowd and, you know, it's, it's my business. I've got to do it. So I'm not bitching about it. But what I, what I do say is give and take. Remember that certain people have extended themselves to help you and your career. Just keep that in the, in the memory bank. And sometimes it's good to pay back when needed. If it's, even if it's just a kind word to say, hey, great show. You know, what it's can the least I do you can help? do. Man, let me sell the ticket. Let me post your, let me put your poster on my social media. Sometimes people don't even freaking want to do that because it's too much trouble or they don't want to promote your show because it's going to upset some other prick. 
you know, so, you know, I could go on, Will. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm sure but, you can. You know, you, you, you dig and dig, man, and the, the business and the sport has many layers, many layers that the fans don't see. A lot of fans don't, people... he, don't even hear any of this stuff, you know. Um, That's sharing right. That's things, right. uh, who is your loyal, uh, loyal supporters, loyal trainers, loyal gyms. Yep. Everyone's got a tight yep. circle. And you can see that going to show to show. I tell it to everybody, at the end of the day, it's just two guys fighting in the ring in the venue. But it's the people around that team that makes the show what it is that creates the Certainly. atmosphere. And you've done Certainly. that before as well. And the fighters will come and go. Let's be, let's be clear. You know, the fighters will come and go. But what I say to the fighters is don't just come and take and go. Be a part of the sport. Make it part of your life. When you finish fighting, give back. Give back because every fighter has had sparring partners, has had trainers, has had supporters, has had, you know, gym love given to them. Heaped on, some of them have had it heaped on them. But when it's not about them, they go. And that essentially will tell you a lot about that person's character. It can be you a know, very selfish you're sport. Martial artist, you're a martial artist for life. That's the, and that comes back to our original point. Fighters can be very self-centered, self-serving. That's why I like to create martial artists, not fighters, because it's a mindset of you turn up, you train because you love it, you help people that have less skill, that are looking for help. Because to help people and to train people for me now, that's like that's as good as any trophy I've got in my trophy cabinet. You know, when I do, you know, I look at River doing well. I look at Sammy, you know, Sammy Hemming. I look at Brock. I look at Chris Harrington. You know, the list goes on of guys that, that I put in the ring that do well. And I'm so proud. And I feel, you know, I feel lucky to be a part of that journey. But at the same time, I, I, I hope that they, they, they don't forget that, you know, there was a lot of effort put into them to get them to the to, to, to whatever you know achieve whatever they did win lose or draw you know help help other people because it, it gives you so much self satisfaction and gratification when you can't do it anymore you know I can't fight like I used to anymore but I've, my experience and and what I can see emulated in fighters coming through really makes me proud and that that's that's where I find you know my worth these days. That's great to hear, man. And I really appreciate the chat. Hopefully, it will be a great insight for people to hear about the martial arts industry, but also your history as well. And, man, I can't wait to come back to your gym and also be at the next Warriors way that you put on. Yeah, Thanks thank you, man. Chat, man. We're hoping for October 3rd, so the world's a crazy place. But if it, if it doesn't get as crazy and things get back to normal, October 3rd, I'm going to come back and see what we can do. Even if yeah. it's only 500 people or limited numbers, I'll still do it just because I, I, I want to make sure I get a show out in, in, in spite of all the adversity that this year's thrown at me. I still want to just make a statement and do at least one show to see a good one. Yeah, that's great, man. Well, I look forward to it. Thank you for your time, Hannah. Thanks. My pleasure, man. Thanks for, thanks for letting me be a part of it too, Well, I appreciate it. I know you, you, know, you put a lot of work into this as well and you, you know, your passion for the sport is to be admired. And uh, I say a lot of people come in and take what they can without giving much back. But, you know, your creativity and your work and, and your professionalism, if it wasn't for people like you, we would have nothing to market. You know? I, tell, I tell everybody, it's very easy to talk to a promoter and suck up to them and say, hey, let me do this for you for free. There's always a give and take, like you say, what am I going to be giving to you? Am I going to come to your show and do my work and then leave and then use that for myself? Yeah. Or am I giving back to you and giving back to the community? Everyone can do free work for you, but as you know, free work isn't good. You're good. Your work is good. Because if you do something that you love, if you love what you do, you'll do it well. You're not just doing it. You're not just turning up, take photos and get my invoice at the end of it and go. <laughs> you do it because you love it. You know the moves. You know off a break, they're going to do this. They'll do, you know what to look for. And that, that's the passion that you can't buy. And, you know, that's, that's what makes your work. I've, been, I've worked through the years with a lot of photographers, as you know. And I know good work and I know good timing. And I know, you know, I know someone that, that, you know, is doing things for the for the right reasons, and you know, I, I mean it sincerely. You know, if it wasn't for guys like you, um, and you put out content and you help us have content to put out that keeps us making people be interested in what we're doing, because if we don't have the content, we content we got shit. 
we got an event with a few pictures that anyone can take on their phone. So, you know, you take a part in the growth. You know, what you do is, in, is very important for the sport. Because if, you, if you're not doing it, then we have less ammunition to fire out to try and hit our target audience that's out there. You give us the ammunition, that, ammunition to hit the target, you know. So I wouldn't be you, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love it and I wouldn't be posting at yeah. midnight, one AM, two AM, you know? <laughs> I would say to you, oh, okay, yeah. I'll talk to you next month and you can get all your stuff next month. Yeah, that's all. I know. I, know. Yeah. I appreciate all the good, chat, man. man.